What is up, everybody? And welcome to God Squad Church. I think my mic, yeah, there we go. I'll turn it up a little bit. Anyways, guys, welcome to God Squad Church. I hope you guys are having an amazing time tonight here, and then I hope you guys are enjoying the service so far. Uh, just so you guys know, I put some links in the chat. That is the straw poll for you guys to go in and to be able to vote for the top five for the best of the best this week. And so if you guys want to get in on that vote, you can definitely do so. Obviously, we have Unworthy Seraph taking the throne again last Last week for God Squad Top 5 with his widow shot that he had. He did like a similar clip like two months ago and he was up there for like five or six weeks straight. And so he won again last week, guys. He won the best of the best again last week. He's been on there for two weeks now. But now we have... I believe his name is Suicide Meme, who's coming in with a sniper shot. Apparently, it's sniper shots that gets number one. I'm not good with snipers in general. So unfortunately, I'm probably not going to be winning the top five anytime soon. Whenever I put in a clip, I'll get number three, maybe number four. But I'm not going to be winning with any sniper shots or anything like that. But anyways, guys, I hope you guys are doing well here tonight. I just want you guys to know, if you're coming in here, you just clicked on this for the first time, you have no idea what you walked into. This is a church that is made specifically for gamers. I want to make sure you feel loved and welcome. So if you guys are not new here, can you please give a warm welcome to everybody that is new here in the chat? And I hope that you are enjoying uh, the service thus far. But guys, we're going to move right into what we're going to be talking about tonight. I'm going to give a little bit of a review of last week of what we talked about, because this is part two of the sermon of, of the tale of two brothers. However, um, in this in this parable that's being given. Now, a parable, once again, as I said last week, it's, it's a story that Jesus Christ was giving throughout the New Testament. He would give parables. And basically what it was to do was to teach the people basically um, things about himself and things about the kingdom of God, uh, where people stand with him maybe, and things like that. He was teaching the people literally uh, w about himself through these parables. But they're fictitious stories. They're not real, but they're just stories that Jesus was giving at the time. And last week, we were talking about the parable of the prodigal son. And I told you guys, I didn't like the most of the versions of the Bible. They give this title, the parable of the prodigal son. My, my Bible even does it, but I don't actually like that title. And the reason why is because it's not just the prodigal son. There's not just one son. We can see in verse 11 of Luke chapter uh, 15, verse 11, it says, And he said, there was a man who had two sons. You have the father, you have the younger son, but you have the older son as well. And the older son has just as many problems as the younger one. But a lot of people overlook the older son. But tonight we're going to be talking about him. And so last week we were reviewing, we were talking about the, uh, the younger son and basically what he went through. He went through three different stages. He went through the resist, the resist stage where he was literally resisting the father. He wished his father was dead pretty much by asking for his inheritance early. He was saying, I want the stuff, dad, but I don't want you. And then he takes the stuff that his dad willingly gives over and he goes off into a faraway country and he completely just uses all of it in reckless living. But then a famine comes in the country that he's living in and he desires to feed with the pigs at that point. And this is the regret stage. You know, he's actually desiring to feed with the pigs, something so unclean. And, I, and, and spiritually for us, we get to a point in our lives where we feel so empty on the inside spiritually. And so we start doing things. We start doing sinful desires. We start not focusing on God the Father. And we start focusing on things that we think is going to fill us up. But really, in the end, we keep waking up every single morning feeling completely empty. So then the young son, the younger son, he gets this idea. I'm going to go home. I'm not even going to ask my dad to be a son again, but I'm going to go home. I'm going to ask to be one of his servants so I can be fed with bread. And we talked about how Jesus is the bread of life. And that is the only thing, the only one that can fill you up so you don't have an empty feeling waking up every single morning of your life. You can fill your life with alcohol and pornography and sex and, and violence and Netflix and all these different things. Not saying Netflix is bad, but what I'm saying is when you're trying to fill yourself up with just those things and you're not trying to fill yourself up with Jesus Christ we we put sins in there we put the worldly things into our life we wake up feeling empty the next day so then the son he, he gets to the stage of return he returns home and what does his father do his father opens up his arms he runs towards him he puts he gives him clothes he gives him a ring on his finger he and he literally he starts to make a party for him because he loved him so much he's so happy that his son has returned home. But tonight, guys, 
we're going to actually be talking about the older son. And uh, so we're, I actually, uh, I named the title, it's misspelled on the screen, I am going to tell you that, but I'm going to put it up on the screen anyways. And so the title of tonight's sermon is Misplaced Desires. Yes, it is one S, but we're going to keep up the misplaced anyways. The way that it's spelled, just an error that I had, I'm very sorry. But anyways, Misplaced Desires. We're going to be talking once again about the older brother and how he relates to the Pharisees. The younger brother really related to the tax collectors. Uh, I'll, I'll read for you guys Luke chapter 15 verses 1 through 2 real quick just to give a review once again it says now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him drawing near to Jesus Christ Jesus Christ is about to speak so people are drawing near and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled saying this man receives sinners and eats with them so he's got the tax collectors he's got the sinners with him he's got the Pharisees with him so the tax collectors and are, are they're collectively called the sinners they're in the same category and the reason why is because people would look at the tax collectors the tax collectors would go from house to house collecting taxes but they would take more than what was needed during this time and they would also actually fill their own pockets with what they were taking a lot of the times so they were considered thieves and they were considered during this day and age the sinners Okay, but then you got the Pharisees. These are the religious people. Like they, they, they stand on the side of the streets. They're like, I've been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. I tithed all of this money that I gave last week. But the thing was, was they were doing it out of a prideful heart. They weren't doing it for the love of God, but they were doing it so that others would look at them and say, wow, look at how holy that person is. So we're gonna talk about them tonight. So first, guys, we're going to be in Luke chapter 15. Once again, we're going to continue on with the story, the tale of the two brothers. And we're going to be starting in verse 25. And it says this. Now, his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf, given him some steak because he has received him back and safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. So I'm going to give you guys a couple examples here, okay? People see things completely different from a different, uh, just just where they are in life a lot of times. And some of you might get triggered in the chat of what I'm about to say, but let me finish before you get triggered, okay? There was a game that I was introduced to by a good friend of mine, Unworthy Seraph, a few years ago, and it was I was introduced to the game Warframe. And many of you in the chat play this game Warframe, okay? So I'm actually watching the game. This is how I was introduced to it. I'm watching him play on his stream. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, the only way that I can relate to this is really Destiny. And Destiny, let's be honest, it had more potential than what it actually was. There wasn't really an end game. They really didn't get things right until multiple DLCs later. But the way that I thought about it was Warframe, it looked like the same exact generic level over and over and over. I love grinding, but when I'm playing the same exact level 20 times looking for the same drop and I still haven't gotten the drop, listen, I, 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 I don't want to watch that. It's something that I didn't enjoy. I was seeing it as something that I was completely like, what in the world is going on with this game? I don't like this game. How can anybody like this game? But then Unworthy Seraph told me to try the game and I tried it and I actually liked the game. I didn't love it to the extent that some people do and I don't have a ton of time to go into the grind or anything like that, but it wasn't a bad game. I had a different look on the game after I tried it out. Another example for you guys, sometimes uh, it, it can be difficult depending on where you are, just perspectively. If I'm standing on the ground and I'm looking up in the sky and I see a plane coming by, I'm like, wow, that's really cool. Like, I, ever, I don't understand why, but when a plane comes in the sky, like you have like 20 people you're standing around with, everybody's like, everybody's looking around for a plane, like, where did it go? I, I don't see it, it's in the cloud. But anyways, if I look at the sky, I can see the plane and I see the entire sky. The person on the plane has a completely different viewpoint though and he's looking down at me looking down at the landscape he can see the tops of houses it's the same situation but we have a completely different viewpoint of what's going on different viewpoints can be can come from what you believe it can be from how old you are and really and this leads into our first point it's the type of perspective that you have 
It's a different perspective. And we're going to talk about the older son right now. He has no idea what's going on in any way, shape, or form at the beginning of this, at the beginning of this story. He hears dancing. He smells food. People are celebrating. You know, he hears the music. And, and all of a sudden, he's like, did, did, did I miss, like, is it like Thanksgiving today? Did I miss somebody's birthday? Like, what, what, what in the world is going on? I don't understand any of this right now. And then... He, he goes to the servant and he says, what, what is going on? Why is there all this music? Why is there this dancing and food? What, what, what is happening? Why is there steak on the table? I love me, my favorite vegetable steak, as I said last week, but why is there steak on the table? And the servant says to him, your younger brother, he is back and he is safe and sound. And the older brother, he's like, holly, stinking Louia. I heard he was having a rough time in that far off country. I heard there was a famine over there. Things, things were really hard. I'm so happy. I've been praying for him. I've been praying to God in the name of God, the Father, that he would come. Wait, he didn't do that? No. Verse 28, the beginning of it, it says, but he was angry and refused to go in. He was angry that his brother was safe and sound. That doesn't make any sense at all. We're going to talk about his anger in just a second and why he was angry. But I, you guys had a sermon bumper before that had Genji and Hanzo. And many of you may know the story of Overwatch or maybe you just love playing the game. I love me some Overwatch every once in a while. It's a great game. I don't play Genji because I stink with him. I don't play Hanzo because he triggers me. And now, you know, take away his scatter shot, the one shot kill, and you give him lightning arrows so he can shoot five arrows in your face in 0.5 seconds and you're dead anyways. Still don't like Hanzo to this point in time. But it is what it is. So anyways, we got Hanzo, the older brother, and Genji, who is the younger brother. They're both a part of a tribe. And what happens is Genji, when he gets a little bit older, he decides he's going he's gonna to do his own thing. He's going to basically have a carefree lifestyle. He's going to leave the tribe and do what he's basically told not to do. He's going to live that playboy type of lifestyle. And he leaves. He just He's just gone. And then Hanzo, he's pretty upset with his brother. He's like, dude, you, you're a part of this tribe. You compl- This is terrible. And then I'm not going to get into the reasons why, but Hanzo is asked by the tribe to murder his brother, actually. Now, the older son didn't get to this extent, but here's the thing. Hanzo wasn't happy when Genji returned. He was still upset with him. He was upset that Genji had left to do something completely different. And so it's kind of a similar situation here with the parable of the prodigal son or the tale of two brothers because here we see the older brother is extremely angry with the younger brother after the younger brother returns home. So here's the first reason why the older brother is a bit angry. I'm going to explain to you guys how the inheritance works, okay? In this day and age, you have the father and he has all this wealth and things like that. And in this day and age, the older brother would get two thirds of the inheritance and the younger brother would get one third of the inheritance. Now, this is extremely important to this story. Okay. So the older brother gets two thirds. You might not think, you might not think it's fair. It's just, it's just what it was. It's just how it was in this day and age though. Younger brother takes what he had. He went and spent it. That part of the father's wealth, it's gone. It's completely gone. But then the brother returns, the younger son. He returns home. Now, we talked about how last week uh, the father, he put the signet ring on his son's finger. Basically, what the signet ring signified was that he was no longer um, just, he he was no longer out of the family. He wasn't an outcast anymore. He was brought back into the family. So at this point, with what the father has left, the older brother is now going to get two thirds of what the father has left. And the younger brother, when the father dies, is going to once again get one third of what is left. So the older brother, he's upset. He is angry. If you think about it, overall, from an overall general standpoint, the younger brother, if you do the math out, he's getting about half of the inheritance when really it was supposed to be split up a completely different way. It was supposed to be two thirds to the older brother, one third to the younger brother. And the older brother thought, he already used it. He already wasted it. I deserve my two thirds. He doesn't deserve any of this. And so he's getting a little bit angry. But here's the thing. His perspective on the younger son was in the wrong place. He should have been happy that he was home, but he wasn't happy at all. 
But we get to this point sometimes as well where we get angry with people. So uh, let's, let's, uh, what are some things that we get angry with people about? You know, why do we not forgive people? Sometimes maybe they lied to you. Maybe they lied about you. I mean, me personally, I got lied about at one of my jobs in the past and, and it got me fired from the job. Maybe somebody hurt you or something that's really a massive pet peeve of mine. Somebody hurts who you love in your life. You know, somebody comes at my family or my wife, that is something I'm like, mm -mm, that is not going to happen. You can say whatever you want about me, think whatever you want about me and it'll roll off my shoulder. But something that gets under my skin is when they start talking about people that I love. Maybe somebody stole something from you. But here's the thing. You don't think that that person deserves to be saved in any way, shape or form. We don't forgive them. We're looking at them with the wrong perspective. And you're basically saying, look at what that person did to me. I can't, I can't believe he did this to me. It, he hurt my family so bad. He does not deserve to be saved. Did you see what he stole from me? He stole everything from my house. He literally came and broke in my house. He doesn't deserve anything. He doesn't deserve to be saved either. But here's the thing. God has a completely different way of looking at things. He has a different perspective. I'm going to uh, give an overview of a story that happens in Acts. Now, in Acts chapter 7, um, there's this man named Stephen, and he's giving a testimony in front of uh, a big, he's in a trial, basically. He's giving a testimony to all these Pharisees, Sadducees, and the scribes, and he's telling them the story of Jesus Christ, basically, the testimony, how the Old Testament relates to the New Testament, how the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ, and all these different things he's talking about, and they're all grinding their teeth at them, it says, and they get angrier and angrier and angrier. And then finally, Acts chapter 7, verse 58, it says this, Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And then the beginning of chapter 8 in Acts says, And Saul approved of his execution. Now, imagine if God had a normal human standpoint a normal human lens that he was looking at Saul with. If he looked at Saul with the normal human standpoint that we have, the perspective that we have on people that we can't forgive, we would have never have had a Paul because Saul became, becomes Paul. And at that point, we would have never have had the New Testament as we see it today. We, we wouldn't have all these churches that got started. And honestly, Paul was one of the people, he was charged by God to go to the Gentiles, the people that weren't the Jews, to us, to be able to give us the story of Jesus Christ. And if Paul was never there, there's a good possibility that today we would not be sitting here talking about Jesus Christ. But because God looked at him with the viewpoint and the lens that God the Father has with an unconditional love, saying, he wasn't saying, well, you know what? He's been persecuting my people. He was there for the stoning of one, of, one of, my, of one of my people. He's been killing Christians, persecuting them. He doesn't deserve to be saved. No, God looked at him with grace and mercy and compassion. And because he was looking at him through that lens, he said, he's going to do my work. And because God did that, Saul at that point was saved. He became Paul. And like I said, wrote more than half of the New Testament, created multiple churches, and went to the Gentiles to preach about Jesus Christ. We ourselves as well need to change our perspective. When these people are hurting us in whatever way, shape, or form, we need to go to them. We need to be able, not necessarily go to them, but we need to be able to forgive them for what they've done to us. I'm not saying you need to have a, a, a great relationship with the person. I'm not saying sometimes there's relationships that are toxic and you can't be in that relationship, but that doesn't mean that you can forgive the person either. You can forgive that person. If you're willing to forgive somebody, you can forgive somebody. And that's the perspective that we should be looking at other people with. But the older brother here, He's looking at his younger brother with completely different perspective. He's saying, he, it, why, is, why is he back? This doesn't make any sense. But then we are going to move on with the story. And we're going to see why he's really angry. What is really getting under his skin at this point? So we go into Luke chapter 15 verse 28b. Just means it's the second half of the verse through verse 30. And it says this. 
but he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat. You give, you give this son, you give him, you give him steak. You never give me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when his, this son, he, he doesn't even, he doesn't even qualify him as a brother anymore. He says, but when this son of yours, this son of yours came who devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. Why was the older brother angry? He's basically saying, look at what I've done for you, father. I've never let you down. I've never left your side. I have did my job. I've been here every single step of the way. And you never gave me anything for what I did. I did everything for you. I deserve the stuff. The stuff? Hmm. Sounds... Sounds a little bit familiar. The younger brother also wanted the stuff. You see, the younger brother and the older brother had a different way of going about this part in their lives. This is the pride part that the older brother is dealing with. He's dealing with a lot of pride at this point. I've done everything for you, but you never gave me anything. The younger brother, he went off into another country. He asked for the stuff before the father died. Wrong thing to do, but he still got it. The older brother, on the other hand, he had the same goal, but he just went about it a different way. He stayed with the father. He did everything he was asked, but he still did. he didn't want the father either. He wanted the stuff. The younger brother didn't want the father. He wanted the blessings. The, the older brother, he didn't want the father. He also wanted the blessings that the father had to give to him. But now he is angry. He is extremely angry because now he's getting less of a blessing as well at this point, And he feels like he deserves all of it because he's being a little bit prideful. Both of the sons were lost. Not just the younger brother. Not just the younger son. But aren't we like this sometimes too? I'm going to talk about non-Christians first. Non-Christians, this is not every single non-Christian, um, but a lot of them, some of them believe in the afterlife, okay? And they think that they can get to heaven. You know, they might believe in multiple different religions. They might believe that, you know, one of these religions is right. One of them is right. I don't know which one it is, but I believe if I do enough good things that I can get into heaven, if I do the right stuff and I, and I have good morals, I can get into heaven through the good works that I do. But here's the thing. They want the blessing of heaven, but they don't want the Father. You see, you can't have Jesus Christ without the Father. You can't have the Father without Jesus Christ. You need to be able to accept Jesus Christ to be able to get into heaven. Your good works cannot get you into heaven. Only Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ and believing that he is your savior, that is the only route, the only ticket for you to be able to get into heaven. Now, on the other side, the flip side, Christians, once again, you're not getting away with this. Christians get this way too. They have their prideful moments. You know, we have those needy prayers where we want all of the blessings. You know, we want all of the blessings that God has to give to us, but we have a hard time tithing. We want God to answer us in our times of trouble, and we don't understand why he's an not answering us, but we have trouble reading his word on a daily basis. We want all of the encouragement in the world, but we continue to discourage others, and we can't encourage others. You see, we want the blessings, but we don't want to do the work to get it because we feel like we're entitled to it because we've already made that decision. But a lot of times we start sliding back from God and our desires are misplaced at that point. Are we desire more the stuff and the blessings that God has to give, but we're not desiring the Father himself. And many point, uh, Christians can get to this point of pride as well, where they sit down, they're about to read their Bible, and they're like, you know what? I know God's telling me to read this passage right now, but I've read this like a hundred million times, and honestly... I'm not going to get anything out of this passage. There's nothing new here. Or maybe you're, you're, you're listening to a sermon. I've heard this preached before. And that, that pastor, he's got, he's not nothing. He's got nothing for me that I need to hear again. And there's another point of pride that I've seen before. And unfortunately, I've experienced 
I've experienced this before and I got to this point in my life um, a while back at one point. We get to this point of pride where we want others to think that you are more holy than you actually are. You know, you're the person that's sitting in church and you got the Matty Ice sitting right next to you in church, you know, and you want the Matty Ice to, to see who you are and that you're more holy. So you raise your hands up in the air during worship and raising your hand up and really what it signifies is that you're giving your life over to God. You're surrendering your life to God. You're putting both your hands up in the air and you are worshiping, but the people around you, you want them to look at you and you want them to say, wow, he's the only person in church raising his hands. He must be holier than everybody else. We're looking for the attention of other people to be placed on us. And like I said, unfortunately, at one point in my life, I was at that point where I would be raising my hands and I was trying so hard to focus on the Father. But a lot of times I was like, I just want that person to see what I'm doing. They should really be like me a little bit more because let's be honest, I'm a little bit more holier than that person. That's a point of pride that we cannot get to. We cannot get to that point. We stop doing things from our heart and soul to God and we begin to do them so that other people will notice us. Now, we're going to get into the final point and it's going to be Luke chapter 15 verses 31 through 32. I love this parable. I, I love this parable. And the father said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this. Your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And then Jesus ends the parable like that. It's a very interesting ending to the parable. He talks about the older brother and how much he loves him. He talks about the younger brother and how much he loves him. But Jesus doesn't say that the older brother entered into the feast. And this is the third point that we're getting to here. The third point is persistence. So we got, we got perspective, pride, and now persistence. The brother is so persistent on not going into, this, into the celebration. He was showing persistence, being stubborn towards his father. His father was asking him, please come in. I love you. I told you I love you. Thank you for everything you've done for me. But your, young, your younger brother is back. My younger son is back. You should come in. You should celebrate with us. And I truly believe that when Jesus was telling this parable, if we were to think that the older brother went into the feast, if he went into the celebration, that Jesus would have told us that he was going in. But no, he ends the parable right there. It's a very sudden stop. I can only think what the Pharisees were thinking at this point and what the tax collectors and the sinners, they were looking at him. They're like, so where's uh, part two? You know, there's like Return of the Jedi. It's a trilogy. You got a part two to this story? <laughs> Jesus, Jesus says, no, there ain't no part two, bro. This is it. He didn't go in. He never went into the feast because he was being so persistent in his in his in his agony and his and his hatred at this point his anger towards the younger brother i'm not going to that party mm -mm. father you can ask me as many times as you want but until i get the full inheritance that i get i'm not going in there i want the stuff i don't care about you i don't care about my brother my perspective towards him that's what it is my pride towards this situation that's where it is i'm being persistent in this i'm standing my ground i'm being stubborn i'm being thick-headed I'm going to stay right here. I'm not going into that celebration. He had some anger issues. <laughs> Let's be honest here. But here's the thing. This is what the Pharisees were like. They would obey the law and exactly how it was written in the Old Testament, and they would do it on the outside, but they weren't doing it because they loved God. You know, they, they were doing everything on the outside, but the inside of them, their hearts, they, it just wasn't in it. It wasn't in the right place. They weren't loving God the Father. And not only that, we know that they weren't loving God the Father and that they were rejecting the Father because they were rejecting his Son as well. When you reject Jesus Christ, you are rejecting God the Father as well. Like I said before, you cannot have the Father without the Son, and you can't have the Son without the Father. They coincide with one another. When you have one, you have the other. But the thing is, is they continued to reject His Son. 
They continued to reject Jesus Christ over and over. Jesus would go out and start healing people, whether it was on the Sabbath, not on the Sabbath. It didn't matter to them. They were saying, what you're doing is wrong. You shouldn't even be doing this. You know, he told somebody who, who, was, who was paralyzed to get up. He said, he said, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees are like, they're not even, they didn't even say it out loud. They just thought in their heads, who has who has the power to forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus looks at him and he's like, mm -hmm. yeah, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking here. But I can do all things. The Pharisees continued to reject him over and over. And we can see here that they didn't want the Father. They didn't want the Son and they didn't want the Father as well. So we see the older brother, he had the wrong perspective on his younger brother. He had too much pride. And then finally, he was persistent in not following the father. And I think some of us here tonight, whether you're Christian, non-Christian, we, we need to make a decision tonight to break out of this cycle completely. But there's a second point to this third point. It's like a sub point, okay? And it goes along with the word persistence again. It's the persistence of God's love for us. Oh my good Guys, listen to these verses one more time. Verse 31 and 32. This is why I love this parable. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me. He's not going into the celebration, but it doesn't matter. You are always with me and all that is mine is yours. Verse 32. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. What Jesus is saying here is no matter what point you are in your life, it doesn't matter if you're more like the younger brother and you're going off and you're doing things and sinful things in your life, or if you're like the older brother, you have a lot of pride built up inside of you. You know, you're doing the wrong things. You're doing the right things, I guess you can say, but for the wrong reasons. Both are sinful things. But what the father is saying here is I love you both. And so Jesus is saying here, no matter who you are, doesn't matter if you're like the sinners and the tax collectors, or if you're like the Pharisees, I love you. You are never too far away from God. Jesus wants everyone to come to him. And he's basically saying, no matter who you are, what state you're at in your life, no matter what sins you've done, I still love you. You see, it, it, it's not this point where you can, you know, uh, I've had people come up to me and they say, you know, I thought about accepting Jesus Christ, but I, I got to make some changes in my life before I actually do that because he probably wouldn't accept me as the way that I am. That No, the Bible says to come as you are. Jesus Christ, listen, you cannot change yourself. When you accept Jesus Christ into your heart, that's when the change starts happening. That's when you start becoming a new creation. You start seeing things in a completely different life. Like your perspective is changing. Your pride is changing. Your, your persistence is changing. That's what it's all about. It's about the gospel of Jesus Christ. The fact that Jesus Christ died for everyone, not just for a select few of people, not just for somebody, not just for, uh, you know, Sparta squid or not just for stellar cr crash or eye zoinks. No, he died for everybody. Each three of those people, I'm sure are at a different point in their lives. They got different issues going on, but Jesus Christ loved every single one of them exactly the same. And he loves you just the same as well. There's nothing that you can do to make him love you less. And there's nothing that you can do to make him love you more because his love is is unending. It is unconditional. It's called an agape love, which is continues on for all of eternity. And that is a love that we can't even begin to understand. We need to strive to give people that type of love. But that's, man, whew, for all of eternity, no matter what I have done, no matter how many sins I have piled up in my life, no matter how many sins are on my record, when I stand in front of the Father, if he sees the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, it washes away everything because Jesus loved you so much that he would die on a cross for you. So I have a question for some of you tonight. Some of you may not be a Christian. You've never accepted Jesus Christ in your life. And let me tell you about Jesus. Like I said just now, Jesus Christ died on a cross for you with his arms wide open saying, this is the return this is the part of the return. So Jesus takes your sin, everybody sins, the entire world, past, 
present, future sins of every single person that has ever lived upon himself, and then he dies. But then the better thing that happens here, he not only takes the sins, but then he, three days later, he rises from the dead. He broke out of his grave. That barrier that was separating us from God, the Father, and from us has been broken. Jesus has defeated sin. He has defeated death. And because of that, we can be with him for all of eternity. So I want to ask you tonight, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ in your life, if you've never accepted him, if you've already made the decision, you don't need to do it again, I want you to put something in the chat. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ and you want to accept him tonight, I want you to put in the chat an I accept. You're going to see somebody put an exclamation point except probably in the chat. That's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to put an I accept because it's a personal decision that you are making between you and God. And I want to pray with you and we want to celebrate with you as well. So if you want to accept Jesus Christ in your life for the first time tonight, I want you to put in the chat, I accept. I'm going to be looking over every once in a while. Make sure I don't miss any. Now, also, we have... um, we, we, there's the people that already have accepted Jesus Christ in their life. They're already Christians. They are, they already, they, they've already made that decision, but they can see that they're starting to look a little bit like the older brother. They can see the, the persistence in their life where they're struggling with asking, you know, doing the will of God and doing the calling of God, you know? They're, they're persistent against going against him because they're thinking, ah, that's not the calling that I, I need to do right now. Maybe you're persistent in going against God. Maybe you have the wrong perspective on people. You have trouble forgiving people, you know? And maybe you just have a lot of pride built up in your life. Maybe you're that person that's raising your hands in church. Maybe all of your prayers are based around those needy prayers. And so if you feel like that you're that person tonight, you're more like the older brother, you are a Christian, but you want to get back to that point, of, of your misplaced desires, you want to get your misplaced desires back onto where they should be, I want you to put a hashtag replace my desires in the chat. Because a lot of times, like I said, we can get to this point in our lives where we just have all this, this, this pride built up and our desires are not on the Father. It's on the stuff and on the blessings that He wants to give us. And our desires really should be on the Father. So if you want to put hashtag Uh, replace my desires if you want to get to that point in your life. You want to get to that right point. You want to get right with God again. I want you to put that in chat. I would like to pray for us tonight. So let me pray for you guys as we end tonight. Thank you, God. I thank you so much for what you've done for us. I thank you for everybody in the chat that is being humble enough to be able to put replace my desires because honestly, all of us at some point in our lives We've been in the wrong place. All of us have gotten there. We've gotten to the point where we're placing what we want is the blessings that you have for us, but not you. But I pray for these people, Lord God. I pray for everybody in the chat right now. I pray that you would replace their desires. And their desires would not be misplaced in the things of this world, but their desires would be placed on you. That they would be growing closer to you, Father. They might feel like the younger son more. They might feel like the older son more. But whoever they feel like, Lord God, you are there waiting with your arms wide open to receive them, no matter who they are, whether they are coming to you for the first time or returning back to you, Lord. I thank you once again, God, for everything you've done for us. And I pray for everybody in the chat tonight. Pray that you continue opening up their hearts to you. And I pray, God, that you would help them to grow in their love for you and in a relationship with you, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.